kind of race. Understanding between officer and boy, the police departments of 20 different cities organized the Peace Officers Car Club Association. As our first project, we decided to hold a special kind of race. We called in the famous racing driver Ralph De Palma to help us put the show on the road. As the juvenile officer of our town, I explained the race to our police department. It was going to be a safety and economy run, not a speed race. But it wasn't going to be any cinch either. We had staked out a grueling two-day, 663-mile route. Starting in the city of Linwood, California, and moving east to San Bernardino. Then north, cutting through the mountains at Cajon Pass to Barstow for refueling. Then out across the Joshua Tree Desert to Las Vegas, Nevada. Up to the Hoover Dam and back home again. Well, whatever doubts I had that the kids would go for this race were dispelled during my meetings with the Capri Car Club, selected to represent our town in the run because of their excellent safety record. Their enthusiasm was wonderful. They were taking the race seriously. They wanted to be sure they had the right driver and observer. As one member put it, this was no race for a character with a hot temper or a heavy foot and they were choosing in a genuine, democratic way. The people's choice turned out to be Dick Owens, observer, and Jim Hummer, driver. Well, it wasn't very long after that before the Capri Car Club emblem went onto the car and Jim and I went down to the shop. Jim was introduced to the mechanic and looked on as the final adjustments were being made. The last minute tune-up. The carburetor check. The distributor points. Compression and of course the brakes. Then the dealer turned the key and the car over to Jim and wished him the best of luck. And Jim headed out for the official refueling station to fill up with gas. Gas that was going to play the very important role of the measuring rod in figuring out the winner. As you know, it takes more gas to move a heavy car than a light one. So to make things fair for all the cars participating in the economy run, the ton mileage formula was going to be used. To get ton miles per gallon, you take the weight of your car in tons, multiply that by the number of miles that you travel, and then divide by the gallons of gas that you use. Here, for the first time, I could see how well what we had done in our town had been repeated by police departments in the other cities. And here I got my first good look at the other cars. Funny, as I told you, I'm a juvenile officer, but no matter how long I work with teenage kids, I'm always being surprised by their fantastic imaginations. Take the names of their clubs. 
the bright, vibrant colors of their cars and jackets. To me, these were all the clue to the spirit with which they were entering this safety and economy run. They brought to it all the fresh and exciting qualities of youth. When it came to weighing the cars in, you'd be surprised to see how quickly they could become serious. You'd think the cars were made of gold the way they kept tab on the scales. As I looked over the 15 cars that day before the race, I held back my enthusiasm a little. I knew teenage kids were unpredictable. For what appeared no reason at all, they could play havoc with the law. We still had some rough humps to get over before we could say that our approach was right. But we weren't going to keep them in a glass cage. We were going to show them the road, teach them the right way to drive on it, give them all the facts, then give them the wheel and let them shoulder their own responsibility. Now, we could only wait and see. At six o'clock the next morning, there was a light mist. The first car was off on the run, and another car followed it every two minutes. By 6.30, the last car was away and the sun was still down. If there had been a question in anyone's mind as to how exciting this race was gonna be, he'd have his answers soon. At Cajon Pass, the fog was socked in. Heavy fog and mountain driving, as tough a combination of gas-eating driving conditions as you can get. And the boys had to average a realistic 35 miles an hour for the course in order to come in on time. And they had to conform to all the traffic laws and regulations in the two states of California and Nevada, their counties and their towns. The number one car, the capital letter Wise Men from Whittier, lay for a long time behind a tanker before the roadwise, courteous truck driver signaled that there was a safe, clear road ahead. Though the weather broke on the Barstow side of the mountain pass, these boys hadn't been out there more than an hour when they all knew that a safety and economy run was a special kind of a race, a mighty tough kind at that. And if you had any doubt as to whether the boys would be getting a real kick out of the run, you could read your answer, as I did, traveling up and down the line of gaily colored cars in the faces of the drivers. Like Don Pratt of the Buccaneers, or his observer, Roland Ellis from the Falcons, riding beside him. All you had to do was look at the faces behind the wheel. Remember, this is not only a story about officer, boy, and automobile, it's also about the road. These teenage kids were watching it like hawks, doing a job of navigation just like the boy Mark Twain did on the Mississippi River. For the time being, the road was straight and clear. Maximum safety speed, 55 miles per hour. They were moving on to Barstow. The road, like the river, had its branches. They converged at Barstow, and so did the traffic. It thickened, and the cars crawled like flies on sticky paper. You couldn't even get into third gear, and the gas was burning up fast. As Malalka, the driver for the deciders, put it, that was all part of the game, the nerve test. Imagine getting a thrill at 15 miles an hour, sweating out gas.
Palma, who had thousands of checkered flags waved at him in a period of 50 years of association with racing driving, was now behind the flag himself and loving it. Flagging them down, pointing the turn into the refueling station, clocking the kids in. The wide spread between the cars on the road narrowed, and they piled into the station bumper to bumper. I was waiting anxiously for Jim Hummer to come in, and I kind of choked up a little when I saw him make the turn. No sooner had he shut off his motor than I found him coming toward me with a broad grin on his face. The word about the first annual youth safety and economy run had spread to boys in the car clubs all along the route. Here in Barstow, the local car club boys came out to play host. Their hospitality was terrific. The moment a motor was killed, they hopped on the car and shoved it on into the station, saving every ounce of gas. Official clocker gave each driver his time. The Barstow Car Club boys lined up the cars for the next starting position. Then they all joined us for lunch. An hour for lunch was only a brief respite for a two-day haul. Not much time to relax the building tension. But I don't think Jim or I will ever forget that crazy-looking rag doll at Barstow. Soon we were back to the serious business of the race. Again, we were off on the run. Next stop, Las Vegas, Nevada. As we moved through Barstow Bridge, the loud tensions that had gathered in our nerves on the first lap kind of settled down now to a soft, steady hum. And the road, like the river, flowed through beautiful country. The officials, whose job it was to patrol the roads, mark the turns, check on possible violations, were members of the Peace Officers Car Club. Their faces were smiling too beginning to feel mighty proud of their first project. No trouble so far, far, not a single violation yet. And as the road cut through the broad plains, you felt the tremendous space all around you, the country rolling out to the horizon, and you rolling with it. It was beautiful, and you sort of sensed the real meaning behind the word freedom. The road, like river water, was running under you, and all the time you kept thinking, what a strange run this was, where speed was the temptress. You could see her in your mind's eye, a siren coaxing you to open the throttle, burn up the road. Actually, the landscape changes gradually, yet something new always seems to come upon you suddenly, like the stubborn, needle-pointed Joshua trees fighting the heat of the desert. All of a sudden, they were there. And they weren't the only ones fighting the heat. The boys were too. And they fought it all the way into Vegas. Now it was time to give their dry-throated selves and their low gas tanks a long drink. Then, off again to Boulder Dam. As they came into the station, some of the boys were talking about the dam, the hydroelectric setup, how it powered this part of the country. Frankly, they knew more about it than I did. And I realized there were many more valuable things happening on this run than even we had bargained for. It became a kind of educational adventure, stimulated the searching minds of these kids. 
And they were looking forward anxiously to seeing the giant dam, one of the genuinely great achievements of man. It took a lot of driving finesse to get away smooth without wasting gas. A stoplight was like a dragon. You had to move by it on cat's feet. And the password was slow and easy, Jack. No showman could have designed the approach to the dam any better for suspense. It was terrific. The tortuous road dropped down like a roller coaster. You came around a power line turn and there it was, the huge concrete colossus. A wonderful tribute to the ingenuity, the cooperation, the bold creative daring of man in his struggle to control the forces of nature. I got out of my car here, shook the road kinks out of my legs, and watched the tortoise-like machines circling around. The atmosphere of the dam was awe-inspiring. It kind of took hold of you for a few moments and hushed your thoughts. The desert air felt good, too was soft and warm and dry. I closed my eyes for a second and I could hear the sound of the tires moving over the loose gravel. For a moment in my darkness, I could see the wide eyes of the boys. You know, a strange thought occurred to me. These weren't merely individual cars turning here, but each car seemed to me to belong to a long line. Each car was like a new generation coming up the slope making their contribution to society and departing. Progress. The word came upon me suddenly. Progress in the American tradition of this great monument to man. Now it was back to Vegas, to the impound, and of course to Ralph De Palma, a really great guy with a genuine love for boys, standing there bare-chested with the road dust billowing up around him. Boy and the road, both were in his blood. Here we were at the end of the first day's journey, and a wonderful, friendly feeling was in the dust-stirred air of this little impound. Too, the boys from the Las Vegas car clubs had come down to play host and to hear all about the youth run. After I got a first-hand report from Jim, the drivers got their briefing. No drinking, no gambling in the sack by 11, and again, no glass cage. After dinner, they'd be on their own. I've been to a few fancy parties and social events in my time, but I can't ever remember enjoying myself as much as I did having dinner that evening with these boys in the Desert Inn. That evening spoke for itself. It was all there in our faces. After dinner, the boys from the Las Vegas car clubs picked up the boys on the youth run and showed them their town.
I felt mighty proud that night. Officer and boy had hit the real jackpot. No violation on the road, no unfortunate incidents at Vegas. And early the next morning, we were off on the run again, against the background splendor of the desert dawn. itself, almost as if it had heard of our youth run, came up beautifully. A huge shadow stretched over the broad plain as we settled down to the long run. This time we were running all the way home with only a quick refueling at Barstow. As I checked the cars on the road, the excitement began to sneak up on me. I knew what it must be doing to the drivers in the run. The nerve tension was a graph. You could read its mounting intensity in the tight-drawn lines of the faces behind the wheels. In the face of Malalka moving through the Joshua trees. In the face of Danny Waskren rolling past the power lines and in the face of the Pritons driver, Bob Lewis, running through the sagebrush. In the face of Phil Schiffenbacher, listening to the approaching train. In the face of the cutouts, Gary Simpson, heading for the Barstow Bridge. Barstow refueling station was practically empty. This time there was no respite here. The boys were in and out again in a matter of minutes, off on the last leg of the two-day run. No rest at Barstow and now we were running home. And the nerve tension graph that you could read on the faces behind the wheels was running too and running high. The stress climbing in the face of the Domino's driver, Bill Meacham. In the clocker's driver, Jack Long. And in the face of the wise men's Frank Jimenez. Each one sweating out the other right to the finish, where Ralph De Palma was sweating them out too, flagging them home. There wouldn't be any decision as to the winner until the official tabulation sheets were in. And the winner would be announced at a special awards presentation meeting of the Peace Officers Car Club Association later. But the boys in the car clubs were all on hand to welcome home their buddies. You could get an idea of how you did from the number of gallons of gas that you used. So, the tension hung on. were watching the pumps as though they were scoreboards. The way I figured it, this was one race that no one lost, because we won a better understanding between officer and boy. by the mayor of Linwood and Ralph De Palma. Third place winner, Jerry Maxwell from the Eidgers Car Club, City of Bell. 47 ton miles per gallon. Second place winner, 
Danny Waskren from the Drag Wagons Car Club, City of Maywood, 51 and a half ton miles per gallon. And the first place winner, Phil Schiffenbacher from the Rod Benders, City of Pasadena, 55 ton miles per gallon. As Phil took the trophy, I could see his face as I had seen it on the road. And behind that face, the story of the first youth run, the simple story of boy, officer, and rogue.